prices are rising very rapidly. Equities are not reflecting those rise in prices. The prospect of uh, higher love back in a high life again in the second half of this year into next year is highly likely. And anyone who kind of missed the Q4 2020 or Q1 2021 boom, you're being presented, in my opinion, um, a gift. Welcome back to Rockstock Channel, and thanks for checking in. Before we launch into the interview, we'd like to thank all our Patreon sponsors. And for those of you who are new, share a bit about us. RK Equity is an advisory firm run by Rodney Hooper and me, Howard Klein. We are exclusively focused on raising awareness about companies producing or developing the next generation critical raw materials that are powering Tesla's EV battery energy transition. Please register your email at rkequity.com and follow Rodney and me on LinkedIn and Twitter. Please also subscribe to this channel, Rockstock Channel on YouTube, as well as Lithium Ion Rocks on SoundCloud for our podcasts. Please note, Rodney and me are not financial advisors or broker dealers. Nothing you hear in this video is investment advice. Please do your own research and read the disclaimer at the end of this video or on our website. Thanks again for the support, and let's get into the video. Okay, good morning, Rodney. It is a Sunday, June 20th, Father's Day. Happy Father's Day to you. Um, we just got Thank finished. Re- Thank you. We just got finished recording um, Keith Phillips of Piedmont Lithium for Minds and Money. So we figured we'd uh, do a, a Q&A with Rodney Hooper. What's on your mind, uh, I guess, on the demand side and on Ganfeng? 2021 is going to be another great year for EV sales, uh, depending on what numbers you use. EV sales last year, roughly 3.24 million. My forecast for this year is uh, trickled up and up and not necessarily a huge leap in bounds in change in gigawatt hours, but China seems to have fallen in love with those mini EVs, whatever you want to call them, you know, A00 glider weight. So I have 5.3 million in sales forecast. There are others that are talking as high as six. What percentage of the lithium market EVs represent creeps up every year. This year is going to take a big leap up. And what we're seeing is, uh, yes, 2020 was a tough year in the early months because of uh, COVID, you know, globally and and in China. But um, looking at the latest statistics coming out of ICC Sano, cathode production in China is up over 140% year to date between January and May. We have, uh, in our models, a slight increase in South Korea and Japan. So we are looking at cathode production globally up somewhere between 65 and 75% for the year, given what cathode represents, you know, for batteries as a total of overall demand. I have uh, lithium demand now up over 40% year on year. So... If you look through history, there are not too many commodities slash specialty chemicals can cope with that. I have lithium hydroxide in short supply. We're sort of already seeing that now. Fast markets last week, uh, their pricing, uh, they had CIF North Asia up 9.1% and in China slightly less, but CIF Asia and and China spot are now sort of around parity in just over $15,000 a ton. I can't see how that's going to hold. Uh, It's likely to go up another leg because um, sellers have very little inventory. There is some uh, maintenance that happens around this time. So I'm aware of a Chinese, a fairly large Chinese producer that's going into maintenance downtime now in June. So again, going to put more pressure on the system. I have carbonate short as well. It's just going to take a little longer. You've had the Chinese brands selling out now and Chilean exports year over year um, up to um, up to May now, up 43.6%. If you apply that percentage to the whole year, then Chile is going to export, you know, over 150,000 tons, which is above where I have in my models for supply and above what SQM has publicly stated they would have an increase in sales for 2021. I think they were just being coy. So that could put a slight damper on it, but I I still see carbonate also short by year end. So this latest little blip, I don't think will last either. 
Um, so demand, uh, how spectacular. The numbers are ahead of what we expected and we haven't even got yet to the Cybertruck launch, the semi launch, you know, the Ford F-150 launch, you know, uh, LG will be supplying NCMA to GM for the Hummer coming up soon as well. So there's, and Northvolt looking to go into production. So we've got just, you know, tons of, of demand lights going off. So I, I, I do think, as I said, I don't like to say inflammatory things, but I think that um, supply just cannot get anywhere near where I see demand at for this year, given where cathode production is at. So I think it's an important thing. And I think that it is conceivable that we're going to test 20,000, 18 to $20,000 a ton at any rate on, on hydroxide somewhere in the second half. That's amazing. Uh, 20,000 we haven't seen since uh, 20, 16 or so i wrote uh in my recent uh, newsletter you know using steve winwood analogy you know higher love and uh, back in the high life again commodity investing 101 is that equities follow prices and we've seen nothing but a very rapid increase in lithium prices you're calling for an even uh, more significant um you know uptick and even while you know, copper and, and nickel and a few other, there's some news out of China that, you know, they're releasing some supplies from stockpiles of those materials, but you tweeted that uh, there are no stockpiles of lithium chemicals. Sometimes equities follow prices with a lag. And uh, my commentary in that higher love was just looking at the lithium 2.0 period using an example of Aura Cobre. Uh, people talk about 2016 to 2018 as being this big lithium boom, but along the, that boom, there were often 30 to 50% retracements in a lot of stocks before hitting higher highs. And in the lithium equity market, that's what we're seeing. A lot of companies are pulling back. And I expect that they're going, uh, especially if what you're saying is true, uh, with higher prices. And if we get legislation enacted, you know, by the Biden administration, not just proposed uh, going into the fall, it's going to look very good. But that said, some companies, even Standard Lithium, I noticed last week, hit a higher high. Um, and uh, just prior to that, critical elements did before, you know, it kind of came in. So selectively, it's important to be selective because there are, you know, permitting questions out there with certain names. So it's not like everything is going to be perfect. There's also be some geopolitical rumblings in South America, both in Chile and in Argentina and elsewhere. So that I think the one thing in terms of what might drive a higher high is something that, you know, you and I, you know, see is because of the shortage of supply in reacting to demand because there's been so much underinvestment. Advanced assets that are strategic in safe jurisdictions that are closer to production, I think are going to be the target of M&A. And that is likely to drive this market higher in this higher love. When you've got VW already rumblings about uh, talking about getting into upstream exposure, I don't think they will be alone. I think others will make the move. They'll need the security of supply and, and we could see M&A um, being part of it. And, you know, the other topic we, we mentioned was, was Ganfin. I mean, these guys in the last few months, it's Bacchanora, it's Min Metals, it's um, uh, Firefinch, it's Mariana, it's domestic production, it's expanding... Mount Marion production, these guys are going gangbusters. They also raised capital or are raising, I think, 600 million, as is every other company. Livent um, finally raised, you know, some capital. Ganfeng is on its way to being the number one lithium producer. We um, have the highest regard for them. You know, on the other hand, in the context of this geopolitical um, scenario, it's not clear that they can invest everywhere. Right. You know, so they're going into Africa is kind of the first time um, a, a major is really writing a, a check uh, of size into an African project. Yes, they had an offtake with AVZ and the DRC, but this Firefinch and the, and the Gulamina mine um, it was quite high grade is, is, is certainly notable. And then they're buying 
in back in Nora's case, they're actually taking over 100% of a company. They typically go into 50-50. In this case, it's 100%. And originally, back in Nora, when they had their Asian offtake partners, were you know focused on carbonate to uh, Asia. But I think the proximity to uh, the, the U.S. Uh, they might redirect that into hydroxide into the U.S. If there is any company that can take on something that's slightly unconventional, it's the expertise of Ganfin. I agree. We, we've said for a long time that uh, clay will have its day at some point, um, and, but Ganfeng will prove the concept with Bacanora first. They've been very aggressive, actually, in Argentina as well, specifically. It's not only, you know, they're, um, they're evaluating, uh, um, I guess, growing Kachari with, with Lithium Americas, but they've invested in this arena minerals, which is a, a small, you know, company they've invested in Galan, which was also a small investment, but they announced something like a 600 or 650 million solar investment as part of their, you know, their number two project is this Mariana project in Argentina. So that, that's like four projects in Argentina that, that that's quite aggressive. There's a common theme in there, Howard, if you look at this and Keith, Phillips touched on it when we chatted with him. If you look at all of the transactions they're doing, they are massive sized resource assets. Bacanora is enormous. Their Kachari Oleros is big and Mariana is big. So they, the, I think the way they see it is they'll take on the technical challenge provided the resource is large. They'll, they'll work a plan. Yeah, that's right. Multi-year assets. And, and, and Gulamina in, in Firefinch is also very, big. very, very big. 100% correct. I mean, Ganfeng got its start as a processor, so they were always um, resource constrained, and their margins show that relative to Albemarle, who has you know two of the best assets you know in the world um, in Hard Rock and, and, and in Atacama. But they're very much addressing that, and as you rightly said, they're currently at 120,000 tons capacity. Their production's not that big you told me they have 40,000 tons carbonate 81,000 tons hydroxide last year they had talked about a path to 200,000 tons by 2025 and now since March they've upgraded that to 600,000 tons target by 2030 they announced a domestic uh hydroxide growth um uh, by 50,000 tons and uh, well uh, let's let's say that they said 50,000 tons the first 25 is hydroxide they didn't say the second oh okay 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 but i think as, as you and i have discussed i think uh, we assume that gulamina going to supply that also i think they're going to lose their 50% share of mount marion uh cuz mineral resources has a right to every year take their 50% share. In the past, they've always sold it to Ganfeng, but I think the partnership with Mineral Resources and Albemarle um, will, will grow to include that from the Mineral Resources side. So I think there was a little bit of a concern on Ganfeng that they need to shore up their hard rock supplies. I, I believe hard rock to hydroxide is their main focus. And Argentina is going to be carbonate. It's a way for them to lower themselves on the cost curve for carbonate. And then once they crack the the, the clay code uh, with Bacanora, that could go either carbonate or hydroxide for Asia, you know, possibly to the U.S. as well. I don't know about this Min Metals. It's their first um, foray into Shanghai brine. Investors need to sit up and take notice. Ganfen has high liquidity, and now with where prices are, all, they've got high, you know, free cash flows likely to be coming in. They're a reliable supplier, and uh, they're an important supplier to Tesla and to VW and to BMW. And it raises it, an interesting question, how I'll be interested to hear your perspective on. So the reality is, if you look at Europe and their battery strategy, they are welcoming CATL in, they are welcoming LG in, they are welcoming Asian battery manufacturers, some of them with generous subsidies to come and operate in Europe. If, if Ganfen operates in other parts of the world, is, it, is there an issue if they are operating regionally for someone who wants to supply? I don't see an issue with Ganfeng um, uh, producing lithium chemicals in Europe. Uh, I don't think Europe would uh, stop that. 
And I think they would actually welcome it because it's a skills short industry well, well, and region. And, and, you know, if, if there could be technology transfer from the best, you know, in, in Europe, I, I think that that would be fine. I would even go so far. And I, in fact, I, I asked Frank Fannin, who is um, ex state department, this question at a benchmark minerals event, if Ganfeng were to build hydroxide capacity in America, and, and employ Americans and sell all the product to the American supply chain, would he see a problem with them doing that, even in North Carolina? And he said he wouldn't. I mean, I, I think there are some things that if it's close to a military installation, right, you know, then, then it could be a problem. But absent that, I, I don't think they would say no to um, something that's creating American jobs uh, and selling into the American supply chain. Let's just conclude. Demand is growing very rapidly. Prices are rising very rapidly. Equities are not reflecting those rise in prices. The prospect of uh, higher love back in a high life again in the second half of this year into next year, I, I think it, it is highly likely. And anyone who kind of missed the Q4 2020 or Q1 2021 boom, you're being presented, in my opinion, um, a gift with the uh, recent sideways to you know weak those lithium battery materials uh, uh, equities. Do, just one of the things that could really tip this market over is if um, the U.S. puts through legislation for either buyer subsidies or federal tax credits. What do you think on the timing on that? I think by September. Um, it's going to happen. I think that there's bipartisan support to respond to China, to supply uh, to, 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 to the supply chain threat. And there have been a number of um, bipartisan measures already passed. So I've been impressed with, you know, the Biden administration. We'll see ultimately, right? There's still horse trading over taxes in Europe. Um, uh, they signed a deal with Canada on, um, you know, collaboration on raw materials. Yes, I think U.S. will enact legislation and it's making its way through the House and the Senate. There's bipartisan support, but I, I think it'll be late August, September. Uh, you often have this. We're vaccinated mostly in America. People are enjoying the summer. We're out there again. And you know, but the machinery of the government's working, and uh, I, I, you're definitely going to get. Uh, EV friendly legislation enacted of some sort, whether it's 12,500 credit versus 10,000 credit, you know, is to be seen, but it will definitely be positive on the demand side. The question is, the, the, or the positive attribute is that they're also focusing on the upstream supply. They're recognizing that they're, they've been focused too much on the downstream and the upstream is is being forgotten and very well could be a, a you know massive bottleneck but it's still politically challenging you're not seeing um you know jennifer granholm uh, the secretary of energy donning her hard hat uh you know uh, next to a lithium mine you saw her in a coal mine in west virginia because senator manchin is very important you know and then you saw her at a solar farm um but you know the politics of lithium in select states is um, is a bit of a challenge in America, but I think there's going to be great partnership that the supply chain document articulated how close we are with Canada, Australia, you know, and a few other countries. So I think you're going to see, um, you know, some developments on that score. And that goes to a lot of what we've been arguing for is um, the Canada lithium triangle, you know, with Carolina uh, in Quebec and, and Ontario and, um, you know, Australia, I think you could even see Australia and Spodumene making its way over to, to, to Europe and, and to North America at some point, not just, not just Asia. 